flings now. So their laundry smells more amazing than ever. Isn't that the dog's towel? Oh. Hey, me towel, Sue towel. More gain scent plus Oxy Boost and Febreze in every gain flame. Don't call it a comeback, but my guys, the Black Eyed Peas are back on top of the charts and they are doing it with a lead singer who has beaten the odds to find her way to fame. Happening now. With the pandemic wreaking havoc on the city budget, the city is taking a look at where it needs to cut. The Texas Education Agency says it is safe enough for students to return to school this fall. What message the TEA has for parents who are on the fence? The Supreme Court blocks President Trump from ending DACA. I'm Nadia Romero at the White House. I'll explain the court's decision and the immediate reaction. Not a whole lot of activity on the radar screen this afternoon, but we'll take a look at what is out there. And of course, we could use more rain. The newest drought monitor is in. We'll look at it coming right up. The deadline for property tax half payments is coming up, but many people are struggling to pay. If that's you, we have advice coming up. And local state representative Roland Gutierrez introduces something called the PACT Act. Why he says it's needed. The news at five starts right now. At first at five, the city of San Antonio looking at several belt tightening efforts as it prepares for next year's budget. The impact of the pandemic on city revenues could last for years, so city staff is recommending ways to make up the difference. Garrett Berger watching it all unfold. Garrett, how are they going to do this? Well, this is an unprecedented time, so city staff tried something new, a trial budget, so city council members could see where some of those cuts might need to come from. Now, the big question is the general fund, the largest part of the city's annual budget, where they expect a shortfall of $109 million over the next two years. City Manager Eric Walsh said their two guideposts in developing their trial budget were one, no layoffs, and two, maintain community, neighborhood, and services. But some of the savings could come from hiring freezes, furloughs, or even pay cuts of current employees, and pushing off street maintenance projects. Walsh said the presentation partially reflects the efforts city staff have already made this year to brace for an economic downturn. What we said to the council in April was that the, the, the sooner we deal with our financial position, the better off we'll be. If you, it, it's just like with anything else. If, if you let those uh, things linger, they compound. Other budgets are tied directly to funding sources. The city's funding for arts agencies, for instance, comes directly from the hotel occupancy tax, which consultants and city staff alike expect will stay down for several years. So unless the city finds different funding, art agencies could have a hard go for quite, a time, for quite some time. Now, the city council will be having a goal-setting session next Friday, and there are going to be some listening sessions for city for community members over the next week, and we're expecting to see a final budget in August before the fiscal year begins in October. Live in San Antonio, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. New at five, Governor Greg Abbott and the Texas Education Agency giving the green light for students to return to the classroom this fall. School budgets will, rather, districts will not be required to mandate face coverings for students or require students to be tested for COVID-19 symptoms. In March, you'll remember students across the state switched from in-person learning to remote learning when the pandemic first it began its wave here in Texas. In a statement, TEA Commissioner Mark Morath says, while he has deemed the fall to be safe to return to the classroom, quote, there will also be flexibility for families with health concerns so that their children can be educated remotely if the parent chooses, end quote. Additional guidance is expected to be released next week. In New at 5, Guadalupe County reporting its first COVID-19 death. The Texas Department of State Health Services says the person died in New Braunfels. They did not release any other details. Right now, there are more than 40 active cases of COVID-19 in Guadalupe County, and we've learned three more via Metropolitan Transit employees have tested positive for COVID-19. Via says one employee and two maintenance employees are all recovering at home. Each of them reportedly tested positive after coming into contact with a positive patient in their home. The administrative employee last worked in the office on June 15th. The two maintenance employees last worked June 14th and 15th. By the way, you can expect the next COVID-19 update from the mayor and county judge tonight during the KSAT News at 6.
The United States Army has started investigating sexual harassment claims involving a Fort Hood soldier who's been missing for almost two months now. Private First Class Vanessa Guillen was last seen April 22nd in a Fort Hood parking lot. Before she disappeared, she had told her family that she had been harassed by one of her sergeants, but she did not name them. A reward for information in her disappearance has increased to $55,000. In a statement, Fort Hood 3rd Cavalry Regiment Commander Colonel Ralph Overland says they are conducting a thorough investigation and won't stop till she's found. Anyone with information can contact the numbers on your screen or local law enforcement. And we've learned the name of a 17 year old who died at the hospital after a car crash yesterday. He's been identified as Daniel Martinez. At last check, three other people still recovering from their injuries. Police say around six last night, Martinez speeding on South Hackberry near Indiana Street when he struck a gray SUV. He was taken to Bamsey, where he later died. His passenger taken to University Hospital along with a woman and child in that SUV. No charges are pending. Crime stoppers looking for information in the shooting death of 17 year old Greg Pena. He died outside of a home in the 400 block of Aransas back on March 30th. His sister was also injured in that shooting. San Antonio police believe that this was a targeted attack. If you have any information, you can call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. DACA recipients, also known as dreamers, are left to dream another day. Today, the Supreme Court blocking the Trump administration's efforts to end that program altogether. That protects hundreds of thousands of immigrants brought to the U.S. as children from deportation. Nadia Romero is in the White House with details on that Supreme Court decision, as well as reaction from the White House. Nadia. Well, Stephen Ursula, it was a five to four Supreme Court ruling against the Trump administration protecting those 700,000 dreamers in this country from deportation. The president, though, lashing out against those justices on Twitter. Crowds gather outside the Supreme Court, cheering the decision to protect the nearly 700,000 young undocumented immigrants brought to the United States as children from deportation. In a five to four ruling, the conservative chief justice siding with the liberals on the court to uphold the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, also known as DACA. The Obama administration put DACA in place in 2012. Dismantling it was a central campaign promise from President Trump in 2016. I was talking about dreamers for other people. I want the children that are growing up in the United States to be dreamers also. They're not dreaming. It's the second time this week the conservative-leaning court dealt a blow to the Trump administration. The president tweeting, these horrible and politically charged decisions coming out of the Supreme Court are shotgun blasts into the face of people that are proud to call themselves Republicans or conservatives. He continued, do you get the impression the Supreme Court doesn't like me? Yet the justices gave the Trump administration a roadmap to rescind the program, saying a better explanation is needed to stop DACA. That process could take months, putting immigration front and center in the 2020 election. Today, for the next 24 hours, I am in celebration, but the work doesn't stop here. Chief Justice John Roberts says that his deciding vote was not about the merits of the DACA program, but simply he didn't think the Trump administration did enough reasoning to explain why we should do away with the DACA program. Justice Clarence Thomas says that this was all about being politically correct. He believes the DACA program should end. Live from the White House, I'm Nadia Romero. Steve, Ursula, back to you. And Nadia, turning back to the campaign trail for a second, how does this ruling impact uh, the campaign, particularly, is it being considered a win for Joe Biden's campaign? Yeah, Ursula, he is already out with a statement today talking about how he will protect the rights of LGBTQ, of DACA recipients, and that the courts agree with him. And so this is something that you will hear from Joe Biden on the campaign trail. This is a thorn in the side of President Trump, who has tried for the past three and a half years to eliminate much of the legacy of President Obama, even the conservative court not siding with him today about DACA. And it will put immigration front and center and could be the deciding factor for some voters. Ursula. Thank you, Nadia Romero, reporting live from the White House. Thank you.
In new at five, State Representative Roland Gutierrez introducing what he calls the PACT Act today, otherwise known as the Political Anti-Corruption and Transparency Act. Today, Gutierrez referenced two KSAT 12 defenders investigations involving Bear County Justice of the Peace, Ciro Rodriguez. One regarding Rodriguez's short-term salary adjustment, which has now lasted more than two years. The other regarding Rodriguez's violation of the state code of judicial conduct by campaigning for his daughter Zochi Pena Rodriguez in the state Senate race. Gutierrez saying the legislation is intended to hold elected officials and candidates to a higher standard and hold them accountable when needed. What we do in public office, it's a pact. It's a promise to voters. It's a promise to stakeholders. It's a promise to people that if I'm going to be in public servant service, I will follow the law. Gutierrez and Peña Rodriguez are currently in a runoff to be the Democratic candidate for Senate District 19 in the November general election. So there's some timing here as well. We did reach out to the Peña Rodriguez campaign. We have not received a response as of news time. All right, let's take a look right now at uh, live cam outside and have a look at what uh, Adam Kasky is forecasting up for the weekend. Adam. Yeah, and this weekend, it's looking like it's going to be more of the same. Still a slight chance of rain out there, even as today. We saw a few pockets of rain develop. Now we've got the patchy fair weather clouds combined with some higher clouds from basically the leftovers of a thunderstorm that was over the southwestern portion of our area earlier today. Now, Eagle Pass actually picked up two inches of rain in Talia's backyard from that complex overnight and earlier this morning. And temperatures right now, for the most part, low 90s to some 80s out there. 86 West Kerrville, 85 in Utopia, 91 in Canyon Lake, and 92 right now in Windcrest. This evening, that 10% chance of rain through about sunset and maybe an hour thereafter, then just humid with increasing clouds and a southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. We'll take a closer look at the radar. The newest drought monitor is out. We're going to chat about that and talk about the rain chances for the days ahead coming up. Thank you so much, Adam. We've got some new numbers released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They show groups of Americans are being diagnosed with COVID-19 the most and how they are faring. The latest figures from the CDC confirming three groups of people are more likely to have a severe form of COVID-19 if they become infected with the virus. Older people, minorities, and
how am I going to pay my property taxes? It's a question we're hearing as many homeowners who've lost their income are facing a June 30th deadline for their split payment. Twelve your side's Marilyn Moritz took that concern to the county's tax man. That's a common uh, concern that we hear. Hey, my business has been closed down for three months. You know, how am I going to pay my property taxes? Property taxes can be a chunk of change, and for those who split their taxes, the deadline to pay up is June 30th. So what's a cash-strapped taxpayer to do? We asked the tax collector, Albert Uresti. The most important thing for them to do is to try to pay as much as they can of the uh, second half that is due. Because on July 1st, by penalty for the unpaid amount. Next, he says, contact his office to set up a payment plan. That can help avoid another whammy. 20% attorney collection fees come September 1st. Payment plans are how George Arroyo manages his taxes. I still got to pay a thousand something. That's why I make arrangements. Seniors, the disabled or disabled veterans struggling to get by can also get a 180 day tax deferment. Failure to pay taxes can eventually result in a tax lien or foreclosure. So bottom line, if you come see us, we will work with you. If you are struggling to make your payments, there are other resources that may be able to help. You can contact the United Way or dial 211. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All right, so today we actually had a little bit of rain out there this morning across parts of San Antonio and Bear County, and this time it hit the airport with a quarter of an inch. Now we had sunshine the rest of the day, but we still made it up to 93 for the high temperature. But you look at highs across the area, and they've been trimmed back a little bit west of town because of extra cloud cover. So Uvalde, only 87 today. Rock Springs topped out at 86. Kerrville, you were 91 for the high temperature. All right, let's talk about our weather pattern. And of course, we could use more rain. Now, this is the last week's drought monitor. It is updated every Thursday. So we just got the newest one, and I'm going to advance it right now, look at the difference. The yellow is starting to spread even more across South Texas. So we had a very good May with rainfall, putting a big dent in the drought that previously existed. Now, unfortunately, it's starting to creep back into place, and these little pop-up showers just aren't enough to really impact drought conditions very much. I mean, they're helpful, especially for the lawn and garden, but not quite enough to really sweep away any drought conditions. But look at this. This is great. This is very fortunate. I'm going to put the radar on top of it from last night into early this morning. Right here, Dimmick County, where we really need the rain the most. And Maverick counties, look at that. A couple little thunderstorms popped up in one complex this morning. I'll play it again for you. Here we go. Last night and then again this morning with a lingering boundary, we had that develop. So what are the odds that we get it right exactly where we need it the most, just south of Eagle Pass in the Carrizo Springs area. That was nice to see. And even a few popped up closer to Victoria this afternoon, where we do have the dry conditions as well. As for rainfall accumulations, we talked about that quarter of an inch that hit the airport this morning. But Talia and Eagle Pass, our weather watcher, she measured two inches of rain from the overnight thunderstorm. Then this morning, just northwest of Carrizo Springs there along 83, that's where we have over three inches of rain that was estimated. All right, that was a big downpour. And then last night we had an outflow boundary from some storms in Mexico, and that was a nice efficient rainmaker right along Highway 90 west of town, about an inch of rain estimated. So sometimes we get lucky in these weather patterns, especially when you get those outflow boundaries from those distant thunderstorms. And right now a few little pop up showers and storms along the coastal plain and far south of town as well. But that's all we have to speak of. What we're going to watch for later on tonight is potential development to the west and even north of us around San Angelo as we may get some leftover showers overnight, particularly in the hill country, if that activity develops and comes together. Just cross your fingers, but odds are pretty slim. Upper level high, not parked directly overhead. Okay, so the door is open for at least some disturbances to slide through. It's centered over Mexico, and as we go through time, it's just going to shift westward a little bit, and it's going to eventually put us in this northwesterly flow aloft, and that's going to keep the opportunity there for more of these little hit or miss showers, 
and thunderstorms periodically in the days ahead. And that includes Father's Day weekend. And I'm not zooming in on the future cast because I don't want you to focus on where exactly it's showing those showers popping up. That's very inaccurate actually in these patterns. It's just the the, the general idea that even these models are hinting at some of those pop up showers. So I think for the most part, a 20% chance, but there will be some days mixed in here where as the day progresses, maybe closer to a 30%, okay? But right now it's looking like mostly a 20% chance. That includes tomorrow, 74 in the morning tomorrow, 93 by the afternoon, other than some thicker morning clouds, will be partly cloudy. And then the same conditions through the upcoming weekend. Low to mid 90s for high temperatures, those hit or miss showers and storms, don't cancel any outdoor plans for Father's Day. It's not the kind of situation that would completely wash out your day. We could use a good gully washer, but no, these are those brief isolated downpours for a short period. And overall temperature is pretty close to average, mid 90s. I'm looking like that's going to be a great barbecue day for Father's Day. Let's hope so. Fingers All right. crossed. All right, there's some concern in Austin about some of these tests they're getting back and they're not in the classroom. These are major concerns because originally two tested positive for COVID-19. That number has now skyrocketed to 13. And in addition, another four players have tested positive for the antibodies. When we come back, more about this breaking news coming out of Austin and the O'Connor Panthers are on the prowl back at school. Many as 13 football student athletes have tested positive for COVID-19 at the University of Texas. Another 10 are in self-quarantine who are all asymptomatic at this time. That's according to the Executive Senior Associate Athletics Director for Sports Medicine and Performance, Alan Harding, who says in addition, four more football student athletes have tested positive for the COVID-19 antibody. The 13 total athletes who have tested positive for COVID-19, that includes the original two from last week, are now self-isolating. While we are all trying to get through the COVID-19 pandemic, the Texas Longhorns are also trying to learn the new defensive scheme brought in by Chris Ash, who was hired to replace Todd Orlando before the Bolero Alamo Bowl. The Longhorns won 38 to 10 over 11th ranked Utah. Switching to a 4-3 defense will help showcase talents such as former Steel star Caden Stearns, who's about to start his junior season at Texas. He's detail oriented and I felt like through virtual meetings on the mental aspect, like when I when we get back, um, we're going to be able to slow the game down. And then uh, outside of that, he's calling us a lot, um, just checking in. And again, if I wanted to meet anytime, had any questions about film, he, he's responding within 10 minutes. So uh, the relationship is there and it's continuing to grow. Right now, the Horns are scheduled to kick off their 2020 season on September the 5th at home against South Florida. Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, says football must adopt a bubble format, much like the NBA is doing for its return. If it wants to kick off its season on time for both college and professional football, Dr. Fauci says players will have to be isolated, tested on a regular basis if they want to see football played this fall. The O'Connor Panthers have returned to school for summer strength and conditioning following the hiatus brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. All student athletes, including the Panthers football program, back on the field looking to bounce back from last year after going undefeated in district only to be bounced in the first round of the playoffs against Reagan. Panthers expect to be in shape when it's time to play. We're planning on having football season. We're planning on being able to start on August the 3rd and, and until somebody tells us otherwise. And so if that's the case, you, you, you need every day you can to, to get yourself there. The Panthers are slated to kick off their 2020 season on Thursday, against the 27th of August, when they host Brandeis, in which is now a non-district game for the first time. Because remember, Brandeis and Clark have been shipped over to the school district where host most Northeast schools now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to have to get through all that shuffle coming up. You got it. Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for watching the News at 5 with us. World News up next. See you back here at 6 o'clock.